guys. It's nice to see you tonight. I have a favorite guest. Um, I've explained the rules. Avon was one of our very first guests when we started the Cup of Joe, back when I didn't even know where the calls were going to go or what they were going to be like. And and I was trying to do like PowerPoint slides and be a grown up. So Avon has kindly joined us again and I have so many questions because it's no secret that I think Avon is like a mad genius and um, I'm going to embarrass her as much as I want because now I've got her in the headlines <laughs> so, but you guys know the question um, you guys know the rules any questions quirky questions welcome don't ask anything we could find on Google please um, type it in the chat box and I will filter it through to Avon and I look forward to a really interesting chat. So Avon, this is my question, my first question that I've been dying to kind of unpack because um, it's no secret that I live in my head a lot and I live in my booth. And I've just like, my thing has been, I'll just ignore that I have a body and eventually it'll get out of my way. But you, your other life, your off grid life, your working in nature and doing like all these like real physical things that like I can't even imagine. I mean, you're like a badass in this other life. And I don't understand which Avon came first. How did you marry the analytical bookworm, figure everything out, eight zillion schedules and plans um, with being this physical, take me back to your childhood, to who that Avon was, 10 years old. Ooh, you were right about bringing the questions. <laughs> um, well, you're right that I'm very embodied. Um, I, I'm i very connected with my body. I'm, I'm in love with movement. I've always liked working out. I'm attached to being physically strong. And uh, um, I do a lot of physical work. And I think it's it supports the mind um your body's health clearly has you know has to do with your mental health right yeah um so um 10 years old pretty dark um i uh, <laughs> straight to it um i was i grew up homeschooled i was born into a religious cult and uh that um there were good things about it i learned to read my mother taught me to read when i was two um, and that formed the way I learned in many respects. Um, but it, it was, you know, it was, it was emotionally devastating. I've, I'll be spending probably the rest of my life, um, un, untying some of the knots that that caused in me. And it shaped the way I think, um, as, as well. So what you were talking earlier about how um prior to the call about how how i think differently like there's there's a good possibility that that's some of the reason um so i would say at that time i was much less embodied that the mind came first to answer your question and, and then when then did I, the embodiment come in was it like um, a release or a, an escape i think so yeah when he, he was in he was in teenagehood you know, when I discovered I was, I had, I was above average strength for a woman and, and uh, um, that I like to throw things. Uh, and then later that I like to hit things, you know, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I fell in love with the gym um, for, for a time I was a competitive uh, border cross snowboarder. Um, wow. So. Wow, and you were never afraid? I, like ooh. physically afraid? I have almost no physical fear. Really? But but um, I should correct that. And there are photos of me as an infant holding my father's hammer because my dad was, was a builder. And my earliest memories are of working with him, you know, and so, so and that's very physical. I was always attracted to that, to building. And of course, I became a builder. I, that's what I did for... I, for nearly 30 years. So when you're 10 years old, are you thinking, what am I going to be when I grow up? Are you living in the exact moment? Did you have dreams and ambitions? And if not, at what point did you have dreams and ambitions? 
Um, it was a function of the religious cult that I had no uh, dreams and ambitions of my own, that they were assigned to me, um, and that and they didn't fit. So, so it was a it, it was a source of inchoate turmoil um, <laughs> that I I could only I had only one destiny um, yeah. assigned to me, and therefore there was no room to dream. So that came but, much, much later, 20s. But, and I'm not, I'm not minimizing this because I can't even imagine unpacking that as an adult. I mean, I've got my own screwed up beliefs and I think everyone does just with normal dysfunctional parents that we all had. So, and so like the whole, that outside influence, but I can't help but wonder if in that unpacking, and if the having to find and define yourself later, because there is something about you. That, you know how they say the crack in the China vase. I can I, I mix up my metaphors and everything. And you know, it's it. It's in the cracks that we're the most human. That's the most beautiful parts of us. And that's how the, the light gets in. You you pushing for the strength and you finding your own strength and you defining yourself and just from knowing you, you analyzing and thinking so deeply about every single move and who you are. Mm -hmm. But it's it's created this beautiful whole package of this like evolving person that like if you had been in like leave it to beaver suburbs, you maybe you would have eventually found but do you see what i'm saying i'm not saying oh, be grateful for the hard absolutely. times absolutely i i do i would not think the way i do if i had not been forced to think critically yeah. about everything including how i think and you know and and every single belief i have to have to uh, analyze it i definitely wouldn't think the way i do without having that experience um i'm not quite at the point of of being thrilled about it um yeah and and I'm not sure about the wholeness of it, but it absolutely shaped the way I think and learn. Yeah. And you'll never probably be, I think that's a meme. That's what they sell us on social media, that eventually you'll be thrilled. You'll have the, I don't think we ever are because it hurts being in it. It makes you an amazing, it's like the stars that they go back and you read their biographies and they're just like, we all no. love them so much, but it was painful being them. <laughs> It was, yeah. yeah yeah for sure yeah. yeah um i don't know if we can love the causes for for the things but I, we can certainly come to love the result and i i appreciate i appreciate the way i think and the skills i have not every day mind you it gets exhausting um like an off switch once in a while but um for the most part i i love that about myself um regardless of the source so jobs so the first job that you chose for yourself um mcdonald's when i ran away from my family at 15 and supported myself at 15. did you enjoy it yeah i kind of did i worked up to drive through like that <laughs> <laughs> I can see you owning the drive through with the headset. Oh, <laughs> Headsets the even at that age. Skater boy at the fillet of fish station. Yeah. He was an artist. <laughs> I remember him kindly. And also um, self empowerment. You know, you did it for yourself. My wage was $3.10 an hour. This is like the walked uphill to school both ways story. But yeah, I'm, so, I'm embarrassed to say I started a job at McDonald's and I quit in one and a half days Ooh. and i said to the manager you're not paying me enough to wear a uniform that looks like this mm. and that <laughs> should have been a clue as oh. to where, <laughs> where i did get another job and i worked hard were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah i just couldn't i couldn't look in the mirror it was just not me so okay so you're working Job away chose for myself yeah, yeah that so you loved. there was a there was a whole bunch of survival in there you know yeah, yeah. I, I was homeless for a time and you know there was a whole bunch of hell um but then around 20 my parents were extricated from the cult that they were in 
and I reconnected with them. And Wait, they were extricated. They made the choice to leave or somebody got them out? No, it, it, you don't have to. If this is, isn't our it business. To, yeah, it, it's complicated. Yeah, the, sorry. The organization ceased to exist, basically. Okay. Um, as happens when it, when a charismatic leader dies, um, so um, so I reconnected with them, and it it coincided with my dad losing his um, his main assistant, so he hired me, and I learned how to build, and I was good at it, and I immediately went out and worked for other men, and then thirty years passed, so like properly built, like build a house, not oh, just yeah. put IKEA furniture together. Oh, build a house, everything, concrete, roofing, drywall. I learned it all. I can build cabinets if I have to. I'm really envious of this because, because the sense of power you have in the world, because I feel that we own our first place and we freaked out when the fire, smoke alarm battery died. <laughs> we free, you have no idea the drama. It was like a half a day trying to figure it out. So this is like... It gives you a feeling of not being able to take care of yourself in the world when you can't manage your environment, right? You know what I mean? And yes. so you must be able, you must feel very confident that you can take care of yourself wherever you go. Yes, I really do. This is one of the most powerful things about my upbringing that I appreciate is that sense of, of, of mastery. Um, and I've taught, I've taught some classes to, um, very young women, um, just to expose them to, or uh, young high school women, right? Um, mm. just to expose them to the possibility, you know, that this is on the menu of opportunity for them, the trades. And, uh, oh, it's, it's so beautiful to see them, you know, go from fear to control of a power tool in 20 minutes. Yeah. Like it, it. Um, yeah, it's, it is, it is very powerful. Um, it's, it's quite a gendered thing or has been, you know, there are very few women in construction and there were even fewer when I was in it. Um, but, um, it, it's true of all people, um, that, that be, being able to, being able to create what you need and change what you need, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's fundamental. No, I'm not giving up. I don't think you're ever too old. I I had no. a sense of it when I did the kickboxing and the boxing, mm. and that was the best I've ever felt in my life because I felt strong. But mm. I was raised that you can't physically do anything. So I, I did the play stupid to make men feel smart. I'm a girl and overcompensate with the brain, but like, Very which a lot of women do. Experience. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, I can talk I my way out of anything, that. but if a killer chases me, I am aware that I probably won't be able to get away or even scream <laughs> at this point. <laughs> but so, okay. So you're going from job to job. You're building, you're loving it. How did you end up living off the grid doing this amazing and also the sanity because I'd love to get a little bit of that I do think that it's so important um that you're in touch with nature and animals and real life because you can bring that into the booth with you and there's a calmness and a stillness at the center of you that those people as mentioning for a friend that don't ever go out in nature might not be able to tap into that focus in the booth you must have that in spades like how much time do you spend outside every day and how the hell do you do it all and find time well as you know I, i'm obsessed with productivity and efficiency yeah um so uh and and brain science so i brought all that to bear to to be able to do all these disparate things and um, but, you know, so I'm a different person from the last time we talked, uh, for, for a long time, I really focused on, on work, everything to do with work, workflow and, and all the thing, all the constellation of things that are required to be in the booth with your digestion settled and, um, everything functioning and your, you know, and, uh, um, I redirected 
all those tools to how I want to feel and how I want to be. Um, and, um, okay. He started with, uh, with how did I, how did I get here? So, yeah. um, you didn't quite do this, but a lot of people tend to react as though it's this magical romantic fantasy. Oh yeah, no, I know it's absolutely okay. not, but I do tend to skip to the good bit. Okay. <laughs> the hard okay. bit doesn't sell as well on the YouTube video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the things that you don't like about camping yeah. um, and that you're glad to be home and that it's over. Like, just yeah. think of a thin layer of that present in my life constantly. Like, it's it's rugged. Um, and so I didn't choose it for this, for, for the romanticism of it. I deliberately chose it um, because I wanted to see how much I could reduce my impact on the environment and still be comfortable and interact with the world. And Seriously? I, that was oh, seriously yeah. front of mind your motive front of mind absolutely wow um and and i also thought it would be a sort of experiment and and example you know but i'm way over that part um <laughs> and so, so i live in a tiny house that i built um it was really important to me i came out of construction and modern construction is just a catastrophe for the environment right now like it's it, um concrete and drywall and styrofoam are just heinous for the environment and houses are built out of that and glue and plastic yeah. you know so we build these carcinogenic boxes and a lot of us are in carcinogenic golf gassing boxes inside of those boxes and I was like I I want to do different so this house has um, a tiny bit of glue in it and a tiny bit of plastic um, and I was thinking, like, if, if this if this burns down, um, I, I was a firefighter too, and I and a house fire is one of the most toxic inhalation hazards in that we have. Let's not not go too there. deeply into that one because I will have nightmares. Oh, That's okay. one of those I don't know how I'll deal with. We had a fire next door a week yeah. after we moved in here, and it was the scariest yeah. experience of my entire life. <laughs> Okay. So, okay. Like, well, yeah. <laughs> like, so I was thinking also about how it, how if it rotted down, what would be left over? Yeah. And in this case, you know, two pounds of plastic. Um, and I was developing environmental sensitivities um, because you cut a piece of a piece of MDF or tile board and you're vaporizing these things. Oh, that that's right. Be because you're like my husband's a house painter, yeah. and I don't even want to think about all the fumes he's inhaled paints improved a lot the technology has improved a lot yeah but he's like really old awareness mm. so, <laughs> it's like... so sorry go ahead um well i'm just um talking about how i was intentional about building the house for for my own health and the the the, the experiment so i learned a lot i matured a lot i had a lot of ideals um, that I've let go of because the answer to how low impact can you get uh, is not very. Um, yeah. And <laughs> uh, it's very first world too. You know, it's it's a, it's kind of it's a luxury. It's a privilege to be able to make that yeah. kind of experiment. Yeah. Like yes, land is cheaper in a rural area, but you have to be able to. Can you work from there? Um, and can your partner work from there? Um, so a lot of people are tied to urban areas. Yeah. But, but yeah. I also, is, I, I have, it's much less than the average. And I'm comfortable. And I don't drive very much. I produce a digital product like we all do. We're not um, molding plastic widgets and shipping them across oceans. And uh, I have very low energy needs. Right. So, so those are some pretty big things. And I and thank I you because going through the heat wave in the UK right now, I thank you because well, I don't have AC either. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Do you not, does it get hot where you are? Like very well, I think so. It gets in, it gets in into the high thirties Celsius and snow during the winter. Oh yeah. And you're not afraid yeah, but... of any of that. Oh, I love the snow. Bring it. I'll roll around in it. I'm terrified. I don't like the heat. 
I, I'm like scared of the snow. I'm I'm such a wuss. <laughs> I am. I am. So okay. So exposure therapy. I recommend. I know. I need. <laughs> I need. I do. But no. But I. I know that's true. That you have to. But the thing about exposure therapy is it requires you to start doing things you don't want to do. And when you when you become a master at just being very very busy doing things you do want to do, it's easy to suck up all 28 hours in a day doing those things so you know. my observation is that when you're when you're under stress when you have yeah. any strain um it's really hard to do new things try new things or push yourself to do more um you have to be at a degree of peace in order to be able to reach farther because those things are minor stresses do you know what's funny you say that because i had somebody mm -hmm. teach me an exercise yesterday because as I told you, I've taken my first week off since in seven years. And so I had somebody teach me this exercise, box breathing, which I'd already heard of, but I just never really did. And she said, because you have to reset your respirate, your nervous system. Vegas nerve. Yep. Yeah. And, and so I, I started doing box breathing just yesterday. Like I'm a pro now suddenly, but, and I spent the day consciously trying not to think about work. And the thought occurred to me this morning that like working so hard has changed me as a person and not in a good way <laughs> made me a little bit paranoid a little bit crazy a little bit j quick to assume things and jump on things and react to things you you become living in fight or flight and so you've obviously managed that because you're in a situation that i think many people would consider fight or flight but because you've chosen it, you're living in the life, you're mm. you're one with it. It doesn't scare you. I mean, just even just the snow alone, you'd have eight million panicked posts from me. So that's really interesting because for me this is peaceful and crowds of yeah. people freak me out. Um I I in a city I'm very I'm very aware of the fragility of it all and you know, here very resilient. Um so, and it's peaceful. You, you, there's been studies about looking at trees every day, how yeah. looking at trees heals your nervous system. Um, and the air, too. The, I attribute the air, like just being here in much cleaner air, that healed my environmental sensitivities. Now I got no problem walking down the detergent aisle. It used to, like, give me a mallet to the frontal lobe headache. So... <laughs> I remember um, air because so when we were little, we'd go to the mountains and you, the minute you get high enough and the trees hit, do you have that kind of fresh air where you are? It would be like, mm -hmm. I think so clear and clean. It was like Nirvana up in the mountains. <laughs> yeah. A little but, more oxygen than where there aren't trees. Yeah. Um, I don't think I remember what oxygen smells, <laughs> especially not now, but so, okay. So narrating audiobooks. What did you mm -hmm. love about it? Um, words. Yeah. I, I learned to read so early, right? And, and reading saved my life. Um, every, every transformational discovery of my life has come through um, somebody else's research um, communicated to me through words. So I'm just thrilled to be in the um, in the in the industry that um, is in love with that, we're all in love with that, right? How have you changed the most in the last five years? Who? Um, uh, much less, much less fear and anxiety. I've recovered from a marriage. I've gotten debt free. I've lost thirty pounds. I've. Um, How'd you do? Th okay, well, yeah, we won't go there because you get me going. Then we'll have the whole call. These poor guys. <laughs> poor Jonathan comes on every call. He's going to be like, oh, God, just don't say the word diet. <laughs> um, I, I've redirected. I've changed what's important to me, I think, is the, is the biggest overall answer to that. Um, to, because a lot of that was survival. I was in survival mode. For a long time and recovering from that and um, recovering implies treading 
ground again, which is true. Um, but it also means to 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 recover something like put something new over it. So, um, so so what's new for me is where I what matters. What matters to me has changed completely. It's amazing. You know what? You saying that you just put something together because I met yesterday. So I started my week off and I scheduled a Zoom call with an eating expert person. And I said, I just want you to like run through a plan with you, make sure I'm doing it right, right? And my plan, in retrospect, it was probably not as realistic now. That I had four different diets that I was going to rotate and do on a very carefully planned schedule. And each one involved like a high degree of attention. And they said to me, basically the crux of it was, I said, how did you get over this whole thing? And the crux of it was, I fixed what was wrong on the inside and the rest of it just stopped mattering and it just took care of itself. So it wasn't like I went and dieted and stopped eating because that's just a symptom of what is bothering me. I healed and then I was fine. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it wasn't a problem. It was just, a, it wasn't the problem. It was a symptom. And I wonder how many things in our lives, because that's kind of what you were saying that you you got out of survival mode, you healed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you just got healthy. I, I wonder how many things, how many of our quote unquote issues or problems would go away if we, even just like people that are trying to get work with publishers, feeling unsatisfied with their career, worried about their social standing. What if you looked in and healed, like you said, got out of survival mode a, I I that stuff wouldn't matter, would it? Yeah, I think I think it's I think it's a lot of it. Yeah, um, and and it you can call it one word healing, but that it's a lot of work, and it's yeah. multifaceted, and it takes a lot of atten a lot of deliberate attention. Yeah, like I, it was a project. It was a conscious project for me, and because I because the way you act, that, I brought day. all that thinking and all those skills yeah. about habit building i'm a monster habit builder and and yeah systems builder yeah. Mm -hmm. um that muscle is huge for me and i brought all that strength to a new purpose you know and i'm still working on it absolutely still but i like that because i picture i picture old avon as in mm. <laughs> the other avon with the habits and the productivity, waking up next to Heal Haven on her way to healing, and the two of them communicating and going, you know, you do it this way, you do it this way. Shut up, stop overthinking. I'm doing it my way. <laughs> Boy, I, I've really changed a lot over. Yeah. That. You know, like even two, two years ago, when you say that. Um, but then, you know, the teenage me and stuff is you can barely recognize, barely find a through thread there. That's the best though, isn't it? A new oh, you. <laughs> I know it's not an easy story, but it's the hero's journey. Right. And in the book, the hero's journey is always exciting. In real life, it sucks. And you just want to get to the <laughs> happily ever after part of it. But but it's fun to look back and just see how far along the road you are. Thanks for you know. reminding me. <laughs> yes. No, but you really are. And the other thing I love about it is because of your strength and the focus of strength on your life and um, claiming your independence and claiming all this, it's not, it, it is the hero's journey. Whereas most women in the books, and I'm sorry, you can call them strong female protagonists in the title. Most women in these journeys are victims. They get the happily ever after, but they don't get to be the hero on the journey. They don't, they get a, they get some snarky comments along the way, but <laughs> I hope someday that changes. And I know it is in a lot of books, but and so, which brings me to, what was it like writing a book then? Ooh. Um, well, that was fun. 
Yeah, um, three of us, as far as I know, um, three of us wrote our first books in... You and uh, Travis in and... Cassandra Metcalf. Oh, okay, Cassandra. Um, yeah, for, for, for NANO, National Novel Writing Month in November, uh, nanorimo.org, um, 50K in 30 days. Um, so Travis and I definitely kept each other going. Neither of us would have written our books without each other. And... Um, of course, he wrote Legends and Lattes, which is already legendary, and Cass wrote um, Betting on the House. So good. It is, is so it? good. And um, and she's got two published now since November, and she's on to her third. That's brilliant. Um, and I wrote an erotica that will forever be pseudonymous because <laughs> I read so many of them, and I thought I had the nerve to think that I could do better than this, you know? I, yeah, I, Anais Nain. Uh, you know, more positivity and agency. Um, so I did that, and I'm glad I did, but I don't care all that much about it. I, I, that was a check mark. And yeah. I also did the three-day novel contest once upon a time in the early 2000s. Um, that's 50K in 72, day, 72 hours. That's just wow. insanity. Um, so that was a dumpster fire, and I think I actually burned it um, back when we uh, printed things out and mailed them. Um, so that one doesn't count. So, And then I've got a pseudonymous one, and now I'm really writing my first book, essentially. And... So, yeah. but do you not care? So, was this is this one a check mark as well, or is this one a passion project? I care about this one. Yeah, I'm. I'll see it through. I'm excited to see if people like it. Um, I, I, I'm almost done, and you know, because I'm still in it, um, I mostly think it's broken or I'm failing and everything is crap. But I have this persistent delusion that it's worth doing, so I will finish it. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I have a belief that those ideas don't come to you if they're not meant to be born. Yeah, that they're not even yours. They, they exist and you need to bring them to fruition once they come to you. Even the plot of the erotica came to me in a dream. Like you got to have some plot to hang it on. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, but you got to grab that energy when it first happens. Because if you don't, it dissipates and it gets clouded up with like other people's ideas. And, and so it's good that you're holding on to them and then you're making them happen. Yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, I understand that protectivity, yes. What are you in love with? What do you love the most? The narrating, your animals, your, what is it that, uh, like, you love the most? I think, hmm, that's a good question. Um, because narr the narrating and writing is so similar to me. They're both, like, caressing words. Yeah just in a different form, um, expressing appreciation for, for the way we communicate our humanity. Okay, I have to interrupt you. I know I asked a profound question. I'm taking you off tangent, but I have to know. Okay, I hope this isn't a rude question, but your kind of lifestyle with the animals, don't they die like all the time? And is it as horrible as when you have a pet and it dies? Because I knew a guy that like was on a farm and he raised a pig and he used to kiss it and hug it and they were best friends. And then he shipped it off to a place and they murdered it and he like collected the money. And like, I never understood the nature of like people that have animals that aren't just like pets. And I've shot and butchered them myself rather than put them on a truck. Um, really? But, wow. Sorry, I'm not and, being judgmental at all. I'm totally get that. And, and I continue to. Um, it's it's an inevitable part of animal husbandry. And you um, see, I I, yeah. I read thrillers with psycho killers. I have no problem with bloody, grisly murder of humans. <laughs> yeah. But, oh, um, gosh. And you probably eat meat, too, you know? No, I don't. Um, Oh, no? Okay. No, um, no. Because I, I eat almost no meat. I eat the meat that I kill. And I don't raise anything for meat because it's hard. It is hard to take a life. Yeah. Um, I, I think that you can become used to it and become numb to it. 
um, and anybody who has to work in an abattoir, you know, has to has to cultivate a, a certain mental state or remove to to be okay with that. I think, um, but it's an inevitable part of animal husbandry to keep the whole happy. To, to for, otherwise, everybody's miserable. You let every rooster live, everybody hates their life. So, <laughs> I think I'm not so great. I think that might be why I'm not so great at life in general, because I've never liked the damn herd. I'd be quite happy keeping my one animal alive and letting the rest of the herd go. <laughs> because like, I don't want to lose that animal. And in um, people, I'm not good with the herd either. So, <laughs> but chicken, chickens are social animals and they like a flock. Yeah. You know, and and they 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 have complex social structures. It's really cool. I have all the acres and my chickens are unlimited. So How many really chickens cool. do you have? Everybody asks me that. I never count them. I And you don't have to kill very, them, do you? Uh, only the roosters. Um because you can't have too many of them. They okay. they disrupt the harmony. <laughs> you can't give them to like people no, that want nobody, roosters? No. You know, but oh. they're delicious organic protein. Hi. <laughs> 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 I, I, I am fascinated so by it. I, I act funny about it, but I am really fascinated about it because the nature, I think of the fact, I think the first time I ever got a budgie and it was the smallest pet I ever had. And I assumed it would be like a guinea pig. I didn't understand the intelligence that a bird could mm -hmm. have. And, and chickens and roosters, my parents had, I didn't get it. And until it started talking to me when I was home alone with it one day, and it was like, I almost fell off the couch. And that's when I became vegetarian, when I tried mm. to cook a turkey for Thanksgiving one year, you and the bird was just looking at me and I, the guilt. So, so I might be nuts, but what happens to your mind when you fall in love with a creature that small that would, for the rest of the world, be insignificant? You develop this profound sense and awe at the intelligence these every single one of these little creatures has do you know what i mean that that gosh living like on a it, farm it, i just think it's amazing what you do for them but then the end i think would just i don't know how you do it you know and, and if you dare to care about one of them you can't not care about all of them and you can't yeah. um be unaware of their suffering um and and there is there is an unimaginable amount of suffering in modern animal agriculture. I, I can't look at that yeah. direction. So, but what I can do is take care of these, you know, give these birds that have come into my responsibility a decent life, you know. And, and dignity. And, yeah, and, and you know, um, a, a, uh, not an unaware death. You know, so so that they to go from consciousness to to absence of consciousness, the way that I would want to go, without without pain, without pre knowledge, without anticipation, like that's really important to me. That feels like a, a, the responsibility of an animal keeper. And now keep in mind that I am not making any money off my animals. I, that's some, that's one of the things I learned. Like I had an imagination about being a market farmer, or market gardener, and I raised pigs for quite a while. And um, I I made the choice that there was no way to make it commercially viable, as in make money off of them to feed myself, and also um, fulfill what I felt was my moral responsibility. So I stopped eating meat, and stopped raising pigs and stuff and I help other people um, give their pigs good deaths and uh, you know to, and provide people with ethical meat like I have no objection to people <laughs> choosing to eat meat but yeah I really I really hope that as much as possible they can choose um, one that had a good death and a better yeah. a good life I mean I've been a vegetarian for almost mm. I'd say 20 years now. I don't, I don't know. I was slowly going there, but there is a hole inside me, I think, because I think the food that you were raised with, you will always crave because that's survival in your head subconsciously. So I was raised with Italian food. 
Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. There is a hole in me, whereas I never feel like I've ever really eaten because there's no meat with each meal. Like I'll, I eat fish, which is a whole other thing. Um, but, but it is, as you say, a moral choice. And I love the fact that you had a very clear between the two aspects of your life, the animals and the narrating and the writing. And you chose to go the path of giving to back to the world rather than taking from the world. Yeah, like um, people assume, like it's actually implied in the word farm, that you, you're making money off of, yeah. off of it, that, that it's a commodity, that you're selling eggs or meat. Um, and I tend to, I, I don't use the word farm to, to, to describe what I have, um, because I'm supporting them. <laughs> you, you, I they they cost they cost more I'm their mom. Yeah. Um you know a bag of organic feed um and I eat a lot of eggs and then I sell some but I'm not in it for I'm not in it for the balance sheet. And I made yeah. that decision on purpose. It it didn't it didn't it, and I witnessed other people's operations and saw them making compromises that I didn't want to make. And I was like, okay, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm consciously, I'm, I, they're here for fun. So they are my pets. Yeah. With, with an amazing protein source. The eggs. Yeah. And the, and the thing with pigs I've read, isn't it pigs that they recognize their own image in a mirror and they have nightmares. I believe it. Yeah. When I heard that, I was like, <laughs> I can't, I just can't. For pigs, they're pretty amazing. When I had a couple prank me, um, they <laughs> they they hid when I was coming with the bucket. They oh hid. no! And and uh, and then I didn't see them. I walked back and forth, and they oinked because I I didn't get it. And they look, and they're and they're hiding. And then as soon as I saw them, they both like jump out of there. They've buried themselves <laughs> in leaves. They both jump out oink, 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 and they run around. They're so excited. They fooled me. <laughs> it was just so obvious. It was this like crystal clear toddler moment, you know? It's, um, they, they are, they, they were, are, they really are. The like, they the... pranked me. That was, that was my big moment. Like, oh, these guys are formidable. I love that. They're like toddlers. They are like toddlers and birds as well. They say that a budgie is the mental level of like a two or three year old. I mean, they mm -hmm. really are like, you know, was being an audiobook narrator. Yeah, I'll just get a bird. It'll be quiet. So you're narrating, you're writing, you're, oh my God, you're like such a different person than the first call because there was like, um, an energy? Yeah. Cause panic I'm in desperation. Yeah. I, I didn't have, <laughs> no, I don't, well, I don't know. I've got this type a energy. Um, I think now I've had one day off. I'm like a whole different person now, <laughs> but, but I've been approaching life with this, like, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. There's one of those hats is going to drop. I'd better get it quick. Hold on. I'll be right back. I'm going to get the hat and I'll be back. I've got 20 million things to do. I'll see you in a minute. That kind of energy. And you mm -hmm. had the, I'm thinking so many things. I'm figuring everything out. Hold on. I've almost got it. Give me just a minute. I just have to figure it all out energy. And yeah. you seem so centered and, and kind of happy and mellow. I'm not sure I ever want to be that centered because like, I quite like being a little bit nuts, but you seem like so happy. I mean, are you doing yoga or something? No, I'm so, <laughs> and, and no, that's so not me. I'm so not a meditator. No. Um, so but... how are you so calm now? <laughs> I mean, I get all the healing and everything, but how are you so? Boy, I would never describe myself as that. Um, I just, I would just say that my drive has become less frenetic. Yeah, and but like, how? I am, st I am still super driven. Um, are you off the caffeine? Ambitious and and like you said, I want to do all the things and and learn all the things and. But you don't yeah, have the shakes. Hungry. So how did you get rid of the shakes? Yeah, so <laughs> the type I, I, yeah, A I don't shakes. have the same pitch of a, of I would call it anxiety. Yeah, that I had because that because that was survival. You know, I was, okay. I, was I was getting out of debt, 
and I was building a career and now I've arrived at this degree of stabilization. I've used those tools so that I have confidence in in my work and my workflow and I'm I have confidence that I can do it all. That was probably missing before because I before I was using absolutely everything I had at my disposal in order to in order to manage. Um, and now that I now that I've managed, now I have more confidence that the things I want to do are possible. Also, you asked about you know changing in five years. I'm a lot better at saying no. I'm a lot really. Better at what kind of things, things do you say no to now? I I got rid of a lot of volunteering. I I, was, I remember you used to be yeah. on all these like things yeah. and all the dramas and. Yeah. Uh, dramas? Hmm. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I was, I don't well, to... I was on a couple. I was on a couple of boards of community associations, and, and stuff. you were dealing with the people, and you were having to do this mm -hmm. role, and then there were hassles mm -hmm. with it. And I remember oh, yeah. all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that's a big thing is not doing the things that suck your time. So having learned that it's much more difficult to extricate yourself from an obligation than it is to not get into it, yeah. I've cultivated getting better at at not getting into them. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to be fair, I think I've, when it comes to work, I've gotten really good at that. I know mm -hmm. what I won't want. I learned my le I learned my mm -hmm. lesson very yeah. dramatically every single time in the worst possible way, but I only learn it once and I never do it again. So like, I don't ever have, I don't ever work with people where I know we're not going to get along and it's going to be me killing myself in a way I can't deal. I don't do that. I'm very good at saying, I am so good now at saying, I don't think I'm the narrator for you. Mm. I do it all the time because I'm not the narrator for a lot of people and it's not going to help any of us if, if See, I try. So requires a, a degree of confidence because you you can't be too starving yeah to be and because well no because they come back and go please mm -hmm. and then you feel really bad <laughs> but it won't but you have to remind yourself me taking on this book and i guarantee that what they're looking for is somebody that's going to like let them listen to it and everything and you know, I mean, as you work with publishers more, you don't have to worry about that so much. So I, I'm lucky. Do you know what I mean? The, the the individual writers I work with, they're doing series. I've already got a working relationship and I don't run into that very much. But um, and no, I've never said no to a publisher for anything. I'm not at that point yet. I'm probably, do you want me to do this 20 hour book by tomorrow? No problem. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I think baby steps. <laughs> yeah so you say no you're happy what time do you wake up in the morning 6 20 6 20 yeah. in the morning yeah god that's because of the whole farm thing huh yes yes it is because i also stay up until one or two so i have to sleep again in the afternoon and this is the, the talk about changes and learning I would have harped on this before um, when when you're building your own systems and discovering what works for you you know um, is not what I expected but I I wake up and I feed the chickens and then I warm up and I get in the booth and I record before I eat because that turns out that that's what works for me. So I work fasted in the morning, and then, um, uh, and, and then, and then the afternoon gets muddy for me, and it always has. Um, I, I become kind of useless and vague and spacey, so I try to nap. Then, do you know what? I get, I get the resurgence of energy. I'm such an owl. I love it when everybody else is asleep. So yeah. like, my best creative time is after 9 p.m. Um, but, but, but in order to do that and also get up at 620, like you, you've got to, um, you got to get your sleep in there somewhere. So I had to add it in the afternoon. I had to learn how to nap. And you know what? Just, I the, built a day that works for me. The thing is the yeah. three thoughts on that. The act of learning how to nap is training your brain 
yes. how to go to sleep on call. Oh, it's better oh, for yeah. you. And Jonathan says, recent research shows napping in the afternoon is a very healthy thing to do. And that brings me to, and I know I've harped on this a million times. If you haven't already, you have to, because this is Avon Shore. Have you listened to the Huberman podcast? Mm. Huberman Lab. First of all, everything you just oh, said is what mm-hmm. Huberman says. Second of all, mm-hmm. he is Avon Shore. I mean, he just is the male Avon Shore, but he's a professor and he okay. studies circadian rhythm and lights. Yeah. And he's got yeah. lots of great ones on on sleep times and on nap times and on being out in nature. And he's got one on movement, Ida Portel, that I think you find fascinating. You have to find, you will be obsessed. It's, it have, is I even. Of, I have a lot of experience with this. Like now that you mention it, it's flooding in, you know, like I'm very um, attuned to the natural light because of my lifestyle. Like you said, yeah. like I'm outside a lot. I'm in and out of the house a lot because it's a tiny house and my fridge is in another building. My generator is in another building. The very yeah. first thing I do in the morning is walk outside. And that's um, two things that you're supposed yeah. to get a half hour of light or 20 minutes at the first thing. And you're also supposed to walk because it's forward movement. You're yeah, setting your brain. You love thing, him. I'm walking before I'm awake because I'm grouching out to feed the damn chickens, you know? So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, please, please check out the Huberman podcast because A, you'll probably already do most of the stuff on it and you'll just be like, wow, I am a genius. But B, you might find some like little jewels. It will appeal to that part of your brain. I'm telling you, Ava, and you'll love it. I've also done a lot of sleeping outside. We like used to it. do that when we were little kids. Go in the backyard and pretend you're camping under the stars. Oh, I yeah. miss that. I yeah, would so never do it now. I, I when when I traveled in Iceland, I think we spent forty consecutive days like sleeping on the ground outside, and I've I've you gone longer about than that bugs? here. Um, I'll I'll, t- I'll tell you a little bit about what my book is about, but. Uh, um, one of the key figures in my, the central figure in my book is a goose. Is it fiction? Yeah, it's very fiction. It's a uh, fantasy world, um, a world other than this one where they value different things. Um, and it's about a goose, a cranky beekeeper, and a teenager finding their gender identity. Very um, cool. But, but the goose is based on a real goose friend that I had, and I slept outside with her for months. Um, Why? Bec- because she wanted to sleep with her flock, who was me. <laughs> so oh. she, she she taught me that this was what she needed, and and we slept. I slept outside on the ground with her for yeah months, a whole summer. Do you know um, that that sings to my heart? With, with my arm around her. That that's. Do you know that I'll tell you the Vlad is the first bird I've ever had that I have to go in there and pretend I'm going to sleep with him for a half hour because Uh he won't go to sleep without his flock. Yeah. It's it's, like the first bird I've ever had that like you have to be there. I learned an awful lot from her. She was incredibly patient with me. I was a very slow learner. How long did you have her? A whole summer. Um, Um, I'm not quite sure of the, a whole summer. Uh, November, I think. She, you, she couldn't sleep inside? No, she would not enter. A, a, she wouldn't go under a roof. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try to embrace my childhood wonder of outside. Now, you've inspired me. I might go out on the balcony at some point this week. <laughs> yeah, there's. well, I guess that's what I was going to say. Like, I, I, I mention it because there, I have this, like practice of sleeping on the ground um and not just doing it for a day or two or or a camping trip but to like a a a constant and there's something about it um i i also have this relationship with sleep like um mostly i take it for granted but i also have this um this feeling this sense that i've had for decades that sleep like what we do in our sleep and dreams may be the most important thing that we're doing with our life energy um oh my god you've got to listen to the huberman podcast i'm telling you there's an episode on that (laughs) 
I bet. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't figure it out in a vacuum. But that's yeah. but also safety because now that you say this, I realize what bothers me that like I've lost, I feel very unsafe. Like I can't even, I used to sleep. I used to open every window when I was a little girl. Like now I have to have the windows closed and in a heat wave, I have to have a blanket on. There's a meme going on around that, but you have to have a blanket on because the monsters, but I do, I feel very unsafe. And I think if you, you're developing the same thing, me not leaving the house very much, the less you do something, the less, the, the more fearful it becomes. So with you going outside in the world, you're embracing the world. So you're developing a communication with the world, with the night nothing's um, going to hurt you you own the night and, and um but i i did that i started that in childhood i think um i grew up very remotely and homeschooled so unsocialized um I was connected to the outdoors even then so yeah i maintained or developed that more i would say that that saved me from my um, spend my spending time in the woods. I chose to live in the woods um, at 19 through 21. Um, I believe that saved my mental health. I wouldn't be alive today without that experience. I, I believe it's inherent. I believe and, it's in all of us and yeah. you, it, you not lose it. Is, not everybody has access to it in the same way. Like exactly. literally not having availability to it the way we do in Canada, like everybody camps and yeah. Everybody has raccoons in their garbage. You know, they're, they're, they're just our countries are different to start but, with. But so you can, we, you can lose it though as well. And you, and you get more industrialized and more mm -hmm. suburban. I mean, we used to go to the mountains. We, you know, we grew up going to Italy and, there, you know, we would be in places mm -hmm. and that wonder and the, that magic, you're in touch with the magic of the world when you're alone in nature. And I, yeah. I realized I'm like safe. a lifetime of watching true crime and reading too many thrillers. You put me in the woods alone. I'm going to be very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't yeah, want to I get that, that a lot from, I get that a lot from people. Like even yeah. my nearest neighbor is like, aren't you scared to be like, live so I'd be remote? terrified. Absolutely terrified. not. There is nothing out here that I'm afraid of. I mean, other say, people that harm people. I can walk the streets of London like any time of day or night. And I'm not afraid. I know I can handle myself and take care of myself and I'm fine. I can go to any club with millions of people, any country in the world, fine. And I'll be in charge and I'll be the one solving other people's problems. You put me on a path with nobody in sight and I'm like crying like a baby. <laughs> and, and since we're both human, that our separate reactions to the same thing, that's learned. It has to be. Yeah. So um, it can be and, unlearned. And so so now, now I would say I'm focused a little bit more on learning how to people. Yeah. Um, because for me, that's a, that's challenging. That's can I ask why? Yeah, I, I'm just well, curious. I, I don't. Because do I, I never learned how to do it. I, I, I grew up without any of the, uh, uh, of the cultural touchstones, you know, no TV, no movies. Um, and a, a very curated experience. So what's um, the feeling? What's the experience in large crowds? I'm trying, I'm honestly it, asking to try yeah. to understand. Um, it's not the crowd, it's not crowds particularly or, 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 or numbers of people. It's just interacting with people, um, kind of at all. And the experience of that is, yeah. um, is, is being an alien of being in a country where you don't know the language. My entire life, I have not known the language that everybody else is speaking. Um, and there's there's science about this, about like actually not learning all of our um, unspoken cues. There's, there's so many like facial cues and things that you don't learn if you're not socialized enough. Um, uh, so, so yeah, my experience is constantly of a bit of unease discomfort that's why i hate clubhouse because oh, I, I can't see them okay. so i interrupt because huh. they're quiet level you know how people have a certain amount yeah, of there's time. a time lag yeah. And stuff. yeah i can't deal with that like length of where the quiet people take to respond to your answer 
So I think they're like dead or gone <laughs> or something. Like, I think that's what you're saying, that we learn a shorthand. And so if you've not you been taught it. it, huh? You learned it. That's what I'm saying is that yeah. I, I didn't learn. Yeah. I feel like I didn't yeah. learn what everybody else learned. I can That's understand that more. That gives me a, a window when people, because I don't understand, because not being an introvert, or I'm not saying you are an introvert. I think it's a different thing we're talking about, but not not. I think I ever that. having that experience. It's 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 like you not understanding how going out in the backyard could actually be scary if it's too quiet. <laughs> you live in the middle of the woods. You know what I mean. I, I I understand it. I I understand it. Yeah. But I I have to I have to build the trail to it. You know, I go, "Oh, well you had a different experience that led you to have these beliefs that cause you to have these feelings and here you are." And I don't just imagine that feeling. So Yeah. And that's the challenge. It is walking in each other's shoes. And as storytellers, who better to do it than us? Yeah, it's a, it's a very beautiful thing to be able to spend um, so much of your time doing the thing that you would spend unpaid time doing, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, understanding other people. Yeah. It's a yeah. particular fascination of mine since I'm a alien in a different world, so I'm constantly... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> trying and spend, to understand people. <laughs> yeah, or spending eight hours in a room pretending you're a serial killer. That's oh, it's good. <laughs> you know, I'm joking. I'm joking. So, okay, I don't want to run out of time. I have to ask you a very crucial question. What would you like to say if you would like the audience in sixty years they're going to be watching you on YouTube to take away from this call? or remember Avon Shore as, or one thing you would say to change someone or to leave them with a thought? What famous last words would you like to leave? Mm, okay. Um, uh, well, I long for a post-gendered world, for, for a non-binary world. And I can, I feel like that, um, I feel like I can see that in the margin of my eyes, and I feel like that would eliminate a whole lot of unnecessary pain. So I hope that in 60 years, we are far closer to a post-binary world where gender doesn't matter. Um, 60 and, years is a long time. It'll it be is. a whole oh, yeah. different world by then. Well, six, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. And, and thanks that's, to that's people like you, we hopefully will still have a world. Mm. <laughs> so... Uh, I I just I just wish for our our culture to care about what matters. Yeah. For us to co-create health of all kinds for all beings. We will go forth and heal. This has been a wonderful call. I'm so glad that you honored us by coming back, Aben. And I'm so happy that I met you um, years ago. That was that was a magical time that the friends that you make when you first start on this journey that you always remember is as you follow the path. So um, you have enriched my mind and my website beyond measure. So it's been wonderful. And we've both grown so much. Yeah, we're like oh, totally different people. Yeah, both <laughs> of us are. Yeah. And it's nice to know, it's nice to have people who witnessed you before because they can validate your progression. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, exactly. Yeah, you bring people together. It's turned huh. out to be your thing. You bring people together. Good to know, good to know. And they're good people, so together we can accomplish anything. So together, guys, thank you so much for joining Mwah! to the studio audience. Video will be out in two weeks. Thanks, Aven. Bye. Let Bye. us know when your new book comes out. We'll link it. Yes. Let me know and we'll put it in the about section of this video. The Truth Seer and the Goose. Is that what it's called? Yep. Okay. The what? The The Truth Seer and the Goose. The Truth Seer and the Goose. We shall link the audio when it's out. 
onto the video. So anyone that watches can check it out. See you guys later. Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Mm -hmm.